to continue our study on meekness this morning. We're uh, finishing up the second outline. We're talking about how meekness is uh, affects our relationship with God, and meekness affects our relationship with our brother. So now we're dealing with how meekness affects people that we love, people we know, people that we interact with. And we'll be in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 32. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 32 says, If thou hast done foolishly, lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. Meekness, under this t- heading, will restrain the tongue. Notice he says in this passage uh, that uh, if you have done any evil, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. Now, obviously, the picture is that you would put your hand upon your mouth for the purpose of not speaking, for the purpose of covering up the mouth so that you don't say what you're thinking or what you're about to say. You cover your mouth, and the idea there is you close your mouth so you don't speak. So meekness is going to guard us. You find in our note here, number 10, under letter C, meekness will restrain the tongue, number 10. Oh, it says, if we find ourselves to be disturbed by passion, disturbed, passion sometimes disturb us, and we then have, find ourselves in a situation, meekness will lay hold upon the mouth and keep us from venting the evil thoughts of our heart towards God or towards our brother. Meekness will lay hold upon the mouth and cover that mouth so that we don't vent and we don't vent how it keeps us from venting the evil thoughts that arise in our hearts. Sometimes the words that want to come out of our hearts are not the words that God would want to come out of our mouths. So before the words come out, meekness throws its hand over the mouth, the mouth and meekness covers that mouth because God would have us to be careful about how we speak. So it guards the tongue. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll be in verse 15. Alright, now in Hebrews 12 and verse 15 it says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Looking diligently. Notice the word diligently. The word diligently is in there because you have to be careful to look for this root of bitterness. A root of bitterness will defile, come up and it'll defile others because you'll poison their thoughts with just the manner in which you say the right thing. You'll say it, but you'll say it twisted in bitterness to infect the minds of other people. And so we know exactly what that sounds like as you've heard someone say, um, you know, did he, did he pay you back? Oh, not yet. Well, instead of saying, no, not yet, he'll probably pay me back next week, it's not yet. And you know what that means. It means probably he's never going to pay me back. Right? I mean, just the manner in which it said same words, but the bitterness is in there. And when the bitterness is in there, it defiles, and so it springs up. Meekness calms the spirit, and by giving us power to dispute without aggravation, to forbear threatening, and to look diligently, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Meekness calms that spirit and gives you, by giving us the power to speak (coughs) without aggravation. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to disagree with somebody without getting aggravated with them? Wouldn't it be nice to disagree with someone without it coming to heat and anger and frustration so that you can actually work something out in peace? I mean, isn't that the way God would have us to do it? And people don't always agree. In fact, people often don't agree. And there'll be very few people who really do agree. And those people are usually people who have been uh, married for many, many years. And they'll, you know, the proverbial finishing each other's sentences. And, of course, then a lot of them don't agree, too. You'll hear them also finish each other's sentences and disagree with each other in the midst of it. Uh, it, It is amazing that... There are very few people who agree on many things, and you want to recognize that that's just the case. And therefore, to 
to come to that agreement is meekness will help you to dispute without aggravation. It will help you to diligently keep an eye on bitterness so that when you speak, the, word, the bitterness doesn't come out. All right, so now letter D says meekness will cool the heat of passions quickly. Although we do dispute, and although we do get aggravated at times when we dispute, meekness will quickly cool those passions. Notice the first number one here says, as it keeps us from being soon angry, so it teaches us when we are angry to be soon pacified. It is true that meekness will keep you from being soon angry, but if you do become angry, meekness will teach you to calm down. Meek meekness will teach you to take the hot pot off of the stove to get the boiling down. down. Uh, maybe you've watched uh, your oatmeal or your potatoes boiling on the stove and the bubbles start coming up and next thing you know they're up over top of the pan and if you don't pull it right off the stove then they'll bubble over and spill. But as soon as you take it off the heat, what happens to those bubbles? Instantly, they just drop down back into the pan like they were ne almost never there. And the heat that's under there is causing it, and you know, just pull the stove off, or pull the pan off the burner, and the bubbles go down, and then you don't have to worry about it. And that's what meekness will do. You might get aggravated, you might get angry, but meekness will allow <coughs> you to pull the heat out from under the pot, and the bubbles come down, and you cool easily. Let's look over in James chapter 3. We're right in, in the Hebrews. James is right next door. James chapter 3, we're going to read in verse 17. James 3 verse 17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteous is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now, Listen to that again. But the wisdom that is from where? Above. Above. And so we find that this is the wisdom that comes down from God. Do you, does this characterize your wisdom? The wisdom that you express in your life. Does it characterize your wisdom? It's first pure. Then it's peaceable and gentle. And it's easy to be entreated. To be entreated means to be questioned. To, be, to come to with a problem. Uh, to be asked of. So it's easy to be entreated. The wisdom that is from above is gentle. It's not likely to provoke and it's easy to be entreated. It keeps its ear open to the first hint of satisfaction, submission, and reconciliation. Thus, anger is easily turned away. You see that it's easily turned away. Why is it easily turned away? Because it's easy to be entreated. It's looking for the answer to the problem. It's not looking to, um, to uh, continue. It's not looking to prolong itself. It's looking to be fixed. And so we find that uh, this meekness makes your anger hope that it can go away, not looking for something to prolong it. So we will, in our anger, we'll hunt in the in reverse for things to be angry about. We'll hunt in the future for things to be angry about and we'll hunt in the present for something to be upset with. But uh, meekness will cause you to look for something to be uh, brought down off of that spot of anger that you've been in. Turn, that anger can be turned away because when you're meek, you look for a way to be calmed down. And so that's number two. Number three, the meek man will be quick to forgive, to overlook a fault or offense. And think of a possible reason to excuse something that provokes him. We, uh, we, we find that it's easy not to forgive, but he's, notice it says that, that the meek man was going to look for a, a possible excuse for someone. He'll say there's no great harm in what's done, or if there is, there is none intended. Perhaps there was some oversight or accident. Do you ever stop when you're angry with someone and say, you know, maybe, I'm, maybe I've misunderstood this situation. Maybe I've taken it the wrong way. Maybe that's not what they meant. Maybe that's just what I think they meant. Maybe they didn't intend it to be the way I'm taking it. If we would do that and give somebody the benefit of the doubt, the Bible says love uh, bears all things and hopes all things. 
If we would hope that maybe I'm mistaken and they're not, then it would settle our anger and meekness would cause us to stop and say, you know, maybe they didn't mean harm. Maybe they did harm, but they didn't mean it. Let me make sure they mean it before I be upset with this. Meekness will cause you to hold off on being angry till you have all the facts in the case. And here it will even cause you to be quick to forgive. And even forgive if you don't know the exact reason to be have a forgiving spirit. <coughs> and then we're going to look at number four. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> like <coughs> looking through a set of... Oh, I'm going to get a drink. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> like looking through a set of binoculars, an angry man sees everything as bigger than it is. And a meek man turns the binoculars around and diminishes diminishes their size, seeing everything as smaller than it is. You ever taken a pair of binoculars and turned them around backwards, and everybody looks way far away? Uh, that's what meekness will do. It'll make everything seem smaller than it really needs to be. This makes provocations easier to pass over. The fire of our wrath is quenched before it takes off into an uncontrollable inferno. And so what we find is that uh, meekness will cause us not to make everything bigger than it has to be, but make it smaller than it has to be. When we're making things bigger than it has to be, it's because we don't have a meek spirit. We're not able to let things go. We're causing them to be uh, uh, to be blown up, embellished, and, and larger than they must be for our own benefit, because we don't know what to do with them. We don't know how to handle them. So we make them bigger because we want them to be in our face, and we want to be to be dealing with this, and we want it to be um, a uh, circumstance that we are trying to control. But in reality, meekness will cause us to say, you know what, God's in control of this. It's not as big as I make it out to be. All right, so now we'll look over at uh, number five here, Ecclesiastes chapter seven. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes is a great book in regards to man's perspective on life. There are a lot of things said in the book of Ecclesiastes that aren't, isn't said anywhere else in the Bible, and it's the reason it's not said is because this is man's view, and the rest of the Bible, for the most part, is God's view on life. But uh, it shows man's view to be wrong. But Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9 says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Notice that word, it rests in the bosom of fools. There are many sparks of provocation in this world, and there's lots of things in our heart. There's lots of tender. Tender is what you put at the bottom of your fire to light it up. There's lots of that in our heart already. And there are lots of things in the world to provoke us. But the the heart, uh, there's much in the heart of the man. It's no wonder that anger comes into the soul of the wise men, however it rests in the bosom of fools. It's no wonder that anger would come into the heart of a wise man, because there's a lot of things in this world, and there are a lot of things in us that would cause anger. But it rests in the bosom of fools. Notice what it says, that uh, it rests. That's where it finds a place to have a seat. It has a find a place to grow. It finds a place of nurturing. We need to be wise and not fools. We might have some anger come into our hearts, but let us let us not be someone who has anger resting, resting there. We don't want to be that person. All right, so let's turn over to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. about this anger resting in the bosom of fools, but notice it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, what that's saying is, don't let your anger last longer than the end of the day. Now, sometimes you get angry in the morning over something, and you have all day to work it out. Sometimes you might get angry in the evening before the sun goes down, and you don't have a long time to work it out, but you only have till the end of the day. Now, that takes...
takes a meekness about you to control how long you're going to let that anger stay because you don't have a lot of time. Meekness will not suffer your wrath to last. Right? And meekness is not going to suffer your wrath to last or to find a resting place in the heart. By the time you recognize that you're angry, you need to start making plans for how you can put that anger down. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You have until tonight to get rid of your wrath, and therefore uh, you have to make plans. So an angry person doesn't want to do that because an angry person is going to want to hang on to their anger and not deal with it. But to get rid of it, to put it down, and to have a uh, time when you are uh, able to um, say, okay, this is how I'm going to do it, this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to speak to this person because what you want that wrath out. You don't want it to have a resting place there. All right, now we'll look over in 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, David comes up against a big problem. David has done a favor for a man who is quite possibly one of the more wicked men. <coughs> Nabal was his name. And Nabal was a very, um, a very angry man. And he does this favor for him. And let's see if we can... Have to, i got too many verses here to really read through them all, but let's see. Let's see. Let's see if I can find here in David. And so we're going to look in, uh, I'm just trying to skip over some of the verses I had written down. Um, what happens in this story is that Nabal is a very wicked man, and David does a favor for him, and he asks of Nabal some goods for his men, and Nabal refuses, and David is offended in it, and he's ready to come back and kill Nabal and every male in the house. Well, Abigail is a very judicious woman, and she is a wise woman, and she recognizes that her husband has made a grave error. And so what she does is she prepares a uh, gift for David to pacify his anger. And she sends it to him, and, uh, and when David receives that, his anger is pacified. And I, I put down, um, let's, see, let's see in verse 37, But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, let's see, actually, I, I, don't, I didn't want to, yeah, I didn't want to read that part, that section. When Abigail saw uh, David, verse 23, she lighted off the ass and fell, and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not thy Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for his name is, so is he. His name meant fool. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the, the young men of thy Lord, whom thou didst send. It almost appears to me when I read this as though, you know, sometimes when I send my guys out to work, they the, the customer will come out and say, I need you to do this, I need you to do that, and none of that's being paid for, and they don't know that, and they have to call me, and they say, you know, what's going on, and I tell them what's going on, and then they get back to the customer sometimes because it's a misconception of how things are supposed to go. And it's kind of like David came to Nabal's house, and he asked the wrong guy. He should have asked the wife, but he asked Nabal, who's a fool, and Nabal just said, no, away with you, and he just went to the wrong department. And they didn't know in this department what this department did, so he caused a lot of grief in the house. And so apparently Abigail's had to do, deal with this before. She's apparently had to deal with her husband and the, the, him not knowing how to handle people. And she probably has done this kind of thing before because it seems like Nabal has a bad problem. <coughs> and so as, he, uh, as, as she speaks to him, 
Um, verse 27, And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make the Lord, uh, my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and, even, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee, and uh, to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in, in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God, and the souls of thine enemies. Them shall he, shall he sling out, as out of the middle of a sling. And so, well, let's see, we'll skip down a little bit, because she's still blessing him. Verse 32, And David said to Abigail, Blessed be God, the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me, and blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from coming to, the sh to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. So here's David, he's aggravated with Nabal, and Nabal's offended his whole army, He's coming to Nabal to shed blood and avenge himself, and Abigail turned his wrath away, turned away his anger with her gift and her blessing and her pleading with him. And so she is uh, giving him this gift, and immediately, verse 32, David said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee. He immediately blessed God. He immediately turned his uh, anger away, and you can see how easily David's wrath, which was just against Nabal, was pacified. How quickly he blessed God. He was a meek man. And he was a man who was willing to have his anger turned away. Willing to have his, uh, his, his, uh, his own name, even though it's supposed to be avenged, he was willing to let that go. And Abigail turned his heart back and calmed him down and he said bless be God I was going to shed blood today but I didn't and, and you're responsible so that's the, the work of meekness you can see how David responded and that's how we have to respond we have to understand that there are lots of times when we could defend ourselves or defend our name defend our position but it's not necessary that we do that uh, God will allow our meek and meekness our, our, our spirits to have that set aside. It should be easily turned aside. With the spirit of God and with the spirit of meekness in us, our anger should be easily turned aside. Our anger should be looking for a reason to be turned aside, looking for any hint of a reason to be turned aside. So at first opportunity we can say, okay, well then I'll put my anger down. Instead what we do is we hang on to it and then as soon as there's any new reason we, we whip it back up and we do the wrong thing, we're looking for a reason to whip it up rather than a reason to put it down. And so if we were to look for a way to put our anger down, we would be questioning along these lines, we'd be looking along these lines, we'd be praying along these lines, and we'd be asking for a way to put our anger down, hunting, hoping, desiring for a place to put down our anger, instead of looking for a way to whip it up, and looking for a way to keep it in... Uh, in, in our spirit, keep it there and protect it. We guard against those things by not looking in the right places. People generally are misunderstood by us. A lot of times our anger is very misdirected. A lot of times our anger is ups we're upset with things and we don't have all the details. And it's how many times in your life have you gotten the rest of the details and you're ang you realize, well, I, I, I'm going to calm down because I didn't understand what really happened. How many times is it that you were upset, and justifiably so, but the other person didn't really understand what was going on? So because you were right to be angry at the situation, but the other person really didn't understand what was going on. And when they did understand what was going on, they expressed their, their regret. And you had to say, well, okay, I, I understand that. You didn't, you didn't really see what you were up to. And so we have to be careful looking for a way for our anger to be put down do that, then God will be able to show us the blessing of his kind of living. He said, come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And a lot of that weariness, that heavy ladenness, is us carrying loads we don't have to carry. Jesus said, learn of me, I'm meek and lowly of heart. Well, how are you going to learn from him if you don't seek to be meek like him, to 
be lonely apart. So that's, uh, we got the end of this outline, and then we'll go from here into the next section, and we'll, we'll learn some more about meekness. I, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying uh, the thoughts of it. It helps me, and I hope that it helps you too. And then the next week we'll have a new, um, a new portion of the outline to study. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the admonition from Scripture to be very careful how we treat people. Not only to be careful how we treat people, but be careful what we do with anger once it gets in our heart. Let it soon be pacified. Let it soon be put down so that we can gently and carefully deal with people. Oh, Lord, let meekness guard our mouths so that we don't say what would be offensive. Let meekness guard our, heart, guard our hearts so we wouldn't think the things that are offensive. And let meekness be on our tongues so that people can hear the words of Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>